I think we can start now. So hello everyone and welcome to EAT. This is our third virtual cooking class. Um, we're excited to connect with all of you today and to make a super yummy lunch of tomato soup and grilled cheese um, with a roasted red pepper dip. Um, we've definitely been missing cooking with all of our students in school and we're so excited to have you all join in our homes to make this yummy lunch. So with me, I have my friend Josh. Josh loves food. He started learning to cook from his dad when he was five and he hasn't stopped yet. When he's not in professional kitchens, he's teaching basic cooking skills to new cooks or he's at home making soup. He knows that kids who cook well eat better and as adults and he really wishes adults ate better. And we also have my friend Myra here today. Myra is so excited about teaching basic cooking skills and incorporating nutrition essentials into meals. Um, she's going to be sharing a dairy lesson with us at the beginning. And she wanted to collaborate with Eats because she believes every child deserves the right to nutritious and delicious meals that are from sustainable food sources. Um, so if you ask me to get started, I'm going to put a link to the full recipe in the chat box. Um, let me go to the chat box. Okay, so I just posted that recipe there. Um, so that's what you can follow if you're cooking with us today. And as we move forward, we want this to be as collaborative as possible and we want everyone to ask questions as they feel um, if they have any. So we decide to slow down with these and chop everything as we go um, as much as we can and to cook with everyone um, and kind of move slower than the first two. So um, at the end of the survey also I'm going to post, or at the end of the class also I'm going to post a little survey um, about, it's like four questions just about what you would like to learn about in terms of food next week or if you have any recommendations or feedback. So I'll post that in the end and let everyone know. But to get started, um, first, our theme this week is dairy. And um, Myra is going to talk briefly about what dairy is. And she's going to touch on some nutritional characteristics and talk about dairy in the United States. Um, so if you want to share your screen, we can touch on a few of those and then get started on our tomato soup. Yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, no more. Most of us are muted, but let's see how this goes. All right, so the reason we're talking about dairy today is because a lot of the things that we're gonna be using in our recipe has dairy in it. So we wanted to kind of talk about where our dairy comes from, why we eat dairy, and how we can make some smart decisions when we're buying dairy. So dairy is pretty much any food that is made from the milk of an animal. And usually in the United States, when we think dairy, we usually think about cows, but dairy can actually come from many different animals. Another um, animal we eat dairy from a lot is goats. We eat goat milk. Um, and in order for us to get milk, we have to take care of an animal who has just had a baby. So kind of like moms, when they have a baby, they, they feed milk to their young. And so in order for us to get dairy from a cow or a goat or another animal, they have to have just had a baby. So a lot of the times, we make sure that the bait that the cow is having babies all year long which is kind of crazy um and if you see on the screen there's a few different types of dairy that i have pictures so we have butter ice cream yogurt cheese and of course we have milk so dairy in the united states um we actually have dairy farms in all 50 states but the most states that have dairy farms are California, Wisconsin. Wisconsin is known for their cheese. Idaho, New York, and Texas. And most dairies 
dairy cows in the United States are called Holsteins, which you can see the picture on the right of the screen is a Holstein cow. And they actually came all the way from Holland in Europe. So you can imagine the long journey that they, they had to take in order to get all the way from Europe to the United States. And we also use cheese more than anything else. So we get all this milk from all these cows and what do we do with it? We make cheese because we love cheese here. We put it on practically everything. Um, and we actually in the United States and pretty much in a lot of places in the world, we are eating and consuming less milk and cheese because people are starting to use plant-based milks. And plant-based milks, instead of milk coming from an animal, we're getting it from plants. So common plants we use are soybeans, oats, cashews, and almonds. And people are making all different kinds of milks these days, which is really cool. And so why do you think we eat dairy? Well, over 10,000 years ago, we started eating dairy um, because people decided to take ownership of cows and other animals and decided, oh, we can, we can drink their milk. And a lot of the reasons we, we use dairy is for the nutritional benefits. So we can get calcium and vitamin D from dairy, which helps us have strong teeth and strong bones. And there's also a good amount of potassium in dairy, which helps us have a healthy heart, healthy muscles and nerves, which is all really important stuff. Another thing is that we can get a good amount of protein and we use protein in our bodies for so many different things. And if we didn't have protein, then it would be a big problem for us. And dairy is also used for making foods, which we're gonna do today, and they make it, the food taste a bit more rich. So we like to use dairy um, when we're making eggs or pancakes or a lot of different baking goods. So we can put dairy in cookies and cakes and we use it a lot. Even though that we're using plant-based a little bit more, we still use a lot of dairy in cooking. All right, I think that's gonna stop for me now. I'm gonna go back to Annalise. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I have a few more things to touch on. I think I will wait until once we start cooking and then I can kind of add um, some things about what dairy should you buy and what is ethical versus um, what do you may, maybe not know enough about um, in dairy and some things and recommendations on where to purchase. So that's something that I will touch on throughout this lesson. Um, for now, we're going to turn it over to Josh and Josh is going to do a nice little hand washing demo. And then he's going to get started with some tasty tomato soup. All right, well, thank you. Um, of course, we always need to start with washing our hands. And if you were here last week, you will have heard that I really do not like the song Happy Birthday. So I have a different way to do it for myself to make sure that I'm washing my hands long enough. So first, get your hands wet. You don't need the water running the whole time because it's not going to be a little bit before we need that again. Liquid soap works just fine. I prefer a bar of soap. And work up a good lather onto your hands. It takes about four or five seconds. You can see nice soapy lather. And then start with the evil genius. Wahahaha. <laughs> and do a five count in your head. Three, four, five, because that gets it on the sides and the backs of your hands. Then between the fingers for a five count. Three, four, five. Both hands, since we use both hands to cook. Four, five. And then make sure you're getting the backs of your hands. Three, four, five. And get down a little onto the wrist too, because you know that's important. And last move is to try to get a little bit under those nails. Three, four, five. And then with a part of your hand that's not so beaten, turn the water back on. Rinse all that off. 
and nice clean dry palette. So now, excuse me, I'm gonna turn my camera back this way. And we're gonna start making some soup. So, I like to have as much of my ingredients prepped out as far as I can before I start cooking. You know, and just to make it a little faster for us, I took the lids off the cans, I measured out a tablespoon of flour, you know, that all the not exciting stuff that you don't really need to see me do. But in exchange, sorry, just want to make sure that I get both my face and this onion into the picture. So I'm going to show you how I cut an onion. Whole onion, you want to start with the top and just right through the skin. We don't need that part. If you want to save it, save it for stock, that has good flavor in it, so we're going to set that aside. But then, now you have your onion with its head off. Cut that in half. You're going to want to keep the root part still on the onion because it just makes it easier to hold it together when we're cutting across. And cutting it in half first makes it a lot easier to take that peel off. So, make sure there's none of that there. Second here. All right, I say easier. Come on, onion. Okay, so now we have our peeled half an onion. Make sure there's no little bits of paper on the cutting board. And the first cuts that I will do are lateral. So we start, and it really only needs one. We're, we're going to be blending this anyway. It doesn't need to be a, a absolutely perfect fine dice. But I cut this way across, be careful, make sure you always know where your fingers are. Then I go that way and then that way. So, trying to figure out the easiest angle to show this. Every time I'm coming up, it basically the knuckle is what is guiding the knife. So my cutting hand is really just going up and down. It's the non-cutting hand that's deciding how big that cut is going to wind up being. So I've now cut it across. Can you see that very well? Might be much better. Um, and now I'm going to dice that down. And you can see a nice small dice. I mean, maybe not perfect, but it's really pretty close. Um, I'll get the last bit. But creating a nice, small, even, regular dice is better for the onion. It's better, you know, really it's better anytime you're cooking something to have a regular cut instead of the random pack at it with your knife and hope for the best. That's not really going to get you good results. So once again, this one, because it's a little bit wider, made two cuts across. Mm. Back across that way. Turn it again. All right, and now we have a diced onion. That little bit at the end sometimes is resistant. Oh no, I have a bigger piece. Okay, now it's fine. So with that, now we're gonna turn on our pan and get that start to get hot. That will take just a moment. Uh, I just wanted to add also, um, if you are, if you use vegetable broth a lot in rices or quinoa, um, using the ends of your onion and saving the peels in a plastic bag and then putting them in the freezer, it makes a really awesome broth. Um, I'm actually going to show you one of mine. So this is broth that I froze um, that I made from a bunch of onion peels and veggie scraps like broccoli. Um, carrots, and then some fresh herbs, and I just put it in a pot, and it makes awesome stock. That's great. I, in fact, have in my freezer right now a bag of some frozen peels that that will be added to. I also, whenever I make chicken at home, 
I am pretty insistent that everyone keeps the bones because I will end up turning that into chicken stock once I have, and again, I'll throw them in the freezer and once I have a bulk of them so I can make a larger batch, then I do. But now, it seems like that pan is yeah, almost hot. We have one quick question. Yeah, that's your question. Do you just, do you put the, um, the vegetables, like the, the peel of the onion in a pot with water? Yeah, um, so you put all of your peels, garlic peels, garlic ends, um, you put it in a pot with water and then you season it uh, with whatever your taste buds like. I usually put like a little bit of thyme and oregano and a bay leaf in it. And then you just let it simmer with the lid on for um, maybe like a few hours, two or three hours. And then you just strain it, jar it, and um, it makes a really good broth stock to use for vegetable or um, to use for rice and other vegetables you want to cook with. Yep, that's cool, exactly. thank you. Yeah. I just made one the other day and I used one of these like a huge corner and put it in another big pot and that way you don't even have to strain it. You just take the veggies out and there it goes. Okay. You have it. All right, so my pan is nice and hot. I threw the butter in. If you're going to make this vegan, obviously that's going to be olive oil or some other kind of non-dairy oil. Once that is hot, it's a lot easier especially when you're using the whole onion to bring the pan to the onion and just push it in instead of trying to like grab some throw it in the pan that stuff is now burning while you're, you still have some on the board just a whole lot easier movement to drop it in though now with that onion it's going to take usually five to seven or eight minutes for that to soften that's on a medium heat right now and we really don't want to get color on the onions, we just want to soften them. So a lighter heat is the better way to go with that. But like I said, that's going to take a few minutes. So actually, while that's going, let me show you the rest of my mise en place here. All right, I can't tell if that's actually working now. So I have I'm a coffee drinker, so instead of milk or cream, I have half and half, because I always have some around. Mm -hmm. My red pepper flakes, I already measured out. That is a half a teaspoon of dried oregano. If you have uh, like a dried basil or Italian seasoning, that works just fine too. Um, two cans of tomatoes. I grabbed some San Marzano tomatoes for that. It's not necessary, they're just nice. Um, any Anything from the store will work just fine. Then a little bit of olive oil. That is a tablespoon of flour, just to thicken it a little bit. And then some basil for the garnish later. While I'm doing that, make sure that I'm not burning my onions. Hey Josh, what if you wanted to use fresh tomatoes instead of canned tomatoes? Absolutely. Um, what you, you totally can. What I usually do when I'm doing it with fresh tomatoes instead and you, you want to make sure you have a good amount is I will usually roast them first. So just cut them in half, throw them onto a, a, a sheet pan with a little bit of oil, maybe a little bit of salt, and basically just roast it so till you start getting that nice brown color. It's totally fine if you just throw them in raw to, to this too, but it's going to take a little bit longer to cook since essentially the canned tomatoes are already stewed. So you're, you're going to increase the cooking time if you use it raw. Whereas if you're using a roasted tomato, it both has a little bit better flavor to it and it, it will make the soup cooking time quicker. But that's a good question. I'm going to give that another moment. So if there's other questions or points or facts about dairy we want to get back to, this is a good time for that. Annalise, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's like the second time I've done that. Um, 
sometimes when I go into the grocery store, there's so many different brands of canned tomatoes to buy. Um, and I never really know which ones. Do you prefer San Marz Marzano? The, yes, I do, but honestly, it really doesn't make a huge difference. Um, one kind of trick with canned tomatoes is usually the harvest on the tomato is once a year. So all of the cans from a specific brand only, you know, they're only harvesting and canning it at one time. So if you find one with a flavor that you like or that, you know, the quality is really good, you're probably pretty well assured that for, you know, at, at least six or seven months, that can is going to give you the same flavor, the same quality tomato. Um, so again, if you, you know, kind of the other end of that is if you find one that you don't like, then you can avoid it. But I've rarely found like truly low quality canned tomatoes. Usually they're at least edible. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I can add a few more facts about. Actually, um, go the, to the next step because my, I mean, I might be a little bit ahead of everyone else, but um, my, my onions are starting to soften significantly now. So at this point, so when, especially with soups, if you're using dry herbs, you want to put them in at the beginning. If you're using fresh herbs, you want them in towards the end. So time to add that. Add the oregano to it, stir it around, and essentially, oh, right away you can start to, to get some of that smell back, but it will become really fragrant in about 20 or 30 seconds. Just, you know, the, the heat opens that up a little bit. And then the next thing up is the flour. So if you do not already have like I did a pre-measured tablespoon of flour, this is a good time to go grab one. But I like to, to measure all of my stuff out early just so at this point I'm not scrambling like, oh no, I need the measuring spoon. Wait, where'd the flour go? And meanwhile, my onions are burning. So we avoid that. And the tablespoon of flour right in there. And that will start to brown a little on the bottom, which is kind of what we want. We're basically coating the onion with that flour and between the, the fat in there and the flour, it basically makes a little, not, not full roux, but essentially that's what we're making here. And it, that flour will probably be sticking to the bottom of your pan, which is fine because the next step adding the tomatoes, we'll be able to get to, the, to scrape a bunch of that off. So now that there's liquid in there, you could, you know, if you're scraping the bottom of the pan, you could kind of feel it's, it's a lot smoother, a lot easier to pick all that little cooked flour up. Uh, boom. Two cans of tomatoes. And my half a cup. Oh no, I forgot the red pepper flakes. That should have gone in with the oregano. All right, well, it's not going to kill anything. And now we will add that milk. Half and half. I'm sorry. Basically, give that a good stir. And now we want that to come up to a boil. So I'm going to throw the lid on there and let somebody else talk for a little bit. Cool, thank you, Josh. Um, if, any, if everyone is ready, I'm going to switch over and prep the grilled cheese now. Um, so if you can see here, this is everything that I will be using. Um, I have some honey lavender grilled cheese I found at the store today um, by Heber Valley Cheese. And that goes back to, um, especially with everything going on right now in the pandemic, it's awesome to support local as much as you can. And Heber Valley is based out of Utah. It's actually up near Midway. And um, they produce really awesome cheese. And um, 
it is a small farmer, family owned, operated dairy farm. So it's awesome to support them uh, when you're eating dairy. The dairy industry is actually quite huge. And um, like humans, cows only produce milk when they're pregnant or have a newborn. But some larger companies impregnate cows so that they can continue to produce milk. Um, if you go into a grocery store, you usually see like a lot of different brands of milk and um, a lot of different types of milk. And I don't have any statistics on how many cows that actually is, but it's probably a lot of animals in probably like a smaller space. So it's really good to support local like Heber Valley. And there's a few other really awesome brands like Organic Valley, Beehive Cheese, um, Drake Valley Farms is from Utah too. So when you are purchasing dairy, it's really good to um, think about the impacts that it has on people and on the planet and to support your community while doing it. So that's the cheese that I'm going to be using. Um, first, what I'm going to do is heat my skillet here over high so it gets hot. And now I'm going to open this and start slicing the cheese. Um, what cheese is everyone using today? Are they using cheddar? Are we using Fontina cheese, goat cheese? Is anyone using any fancy cheeses? I have Colby. Nice. Like Colby's Colby. really good. Yep. Yes. And, so and it's Wisconsin Colby, too, where Colby is from. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. I'm not making grilled cheese today because I ate all my cheese this week, which I had an almond pepper jack cheese from Sprout, which is obviously plant-based, but it was so good. So if you're looking for plant-based alternatives, go to Sprouts because they have really good almond cheese. That's really good to know. That sounds super good too. Um, as I was looking up other grilled cheese options, I saw like a blueberry brie grilled cheese that looked really great. Um, today I'm just going to saute some mushrooms and um, some arugula and then going to add that to my sandwich. We want to use cheddar. You want to use cheddar? The cheddar is super good on a grilled cheese sandwich. It's like my favorite, honestly. So I'm just slicing this cheese here. And since it wasn't a block, it's kind of hard for me to get perfect slices. So I just kind of did these little chopped shreds here to get it as thin as possible. So they melt really fast over my sandwich. So since my skillet is just about hot, I'm going to add um, some butter to the skillet and then add my mushrooms and arugula. And my soup has come up to a boil now, so I'm actually going to turn that heat down and just let it simmer for a few minutes. I know it says like three on the recipe. It's okay if it goes a little longer than that. So once this pan gets hot enough here, I'm going to add um, the mushrooms. I used about two of these baby bellas. You can use whatever mushrooms you would like, but I'm going to chop some more of them just because mushrooms do typically shrink when you, when you cook them. So sometimes you think you have maybe have enough, but it's always good to have more. Oh, you're good. So um, I'm just going to slice these here, kind of like this. And it's really good to get a thin slice here. Um, 
just so that they fit into your sandwich really nice. I've actually always struggled with finding a prop, like the best way to chop mushrooms once you get to the end. Um, so if anyone has any recommendations on what to do once I get here, <laughs> that would be super helpful. I usually just end up going really small. And then I'll do this one. So I have all the mushrooms. And I'm going to add a little bit of balsamic. Um, if you don't like balsamic, don't add it. I think um, just adding like a very small splash of this while you're sauteing it um, is really good with the cheese. So Annalise, what I do with my mushrooms is I cut off the stem because I find it's easier to chop it when the mushroom can be flat on the surface. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you can always go back to the stem and cut it, but when it's flat, it's easier to, to chop it up like so. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Thank you. All right, I'm going to add a little splash. Well, first I'm going to add these actually. I'm going to add all of my mushrooms. I'm just gonna put them in this cup so I can take them over. And if you're also adding spinach or any other green, um, I recommend adding it at the end, just because it tends to wilt really fast. Overheat. And then I'm just going to add like a half a teaspoon of balsamic to these mushrooms. Make sure to turn the fan on so you um, <laughs> don't stink up your whole house with balsamic <laughs> like I did last time I did this. Does anyone have any other ideas for things we could add on to grilled cheese? Other than mushrooms and, and spinach. Collins, I see you raising your hand. <laughs> I made grilled cheese the other day. I want to add some more mushrooms. More mushrooms. <laughs> I love more mushrooms. I added avocado to my grilled cheese the other day and it was delicious. Yum! That sounds so good. I will sometimes go crazy and shred some Brussels sprouts, saute those and I'll put those on my grilled cheese, but mm. that's because Brussels sprouts are my favorite vegetable. I love Brussels sprouts. Josh, I you have to use a lot of places. Yeah, they're so good. I just bought a huge bag of them. I'm going to eat them all. But I really like cooking with vinegar. I'm just trying to figure out how to not think up my entire house while I'm cooking with vinegar. <laughs> Is there any way? I feel like there's not unless you use a lid. <laughs> but um, so I'm just kind of waiting for those to shrink down a little bit. And then once they shrink, I'll add um, my leafy greens and saute all of that together. Ready? I have like a mix of spinach and arugula. So I'm just going to pick. All right. Well, my soup looks like it's basically ready to blend at this point. But that's also going to, since I'm, I'm using the immersion blender, 
and it's going to make a loud noise. If you're using an immersion blender, you can do it straight in the pot. If you're using a, a standard blender, I would go a small batch at a time into the blender just to make sure that it's actually getting blended thoroughly. But I'm going to put myself on mute while I'm using this. Okay, I'm going to plug in the immersion blender and then I'm going to put myself on mute. Oh, and I should also give the warning, anytime you're blending something hot like this, be careful with it. You want the end of the immersion blender fully in the liquid. Otherwise, it's going to splatter back up at you when you turn it on and it's boiling. It's pretty hot right now. You're going to hurt yourself, so don't do that. Josh, I know you're blending right now, but if, if I don't have an immersion blender, is it still possible to make the soup? Or what would I do if I don't have an immersion blender? Do you have any sort of blender or food processor? Let's say I don't. I would, but I <laughs> well, if you're old school and have a, a food mill, that will totally work too, but I imagine you don't. Um, then what I would do with my handy wooden spoon is basically try to break up the tomato pieces as small as you can. Um, it will totally, I mean, it will taste like soup. It'll work just fine. Um, like the, the texture will be a little bit better if you blend it just because then the tomato is more, you know, dispersed in with the other liquid there. But since the base of the liquid is tomato juice anyway, like it's, you're not going to lose any flavor or anything like that. Awesome, thanks. So I just finished sauteing my veggies and here they are. Um, while my skillet is still hot, I'm going to add two pieces of sourdough bread, which is the bread I prefer to eat basically on every sandwich. Um, and it's also good to use I mean, I personally really like to use the same pan that I sauteed my vegetables in just because there's still a lot of flavor on it. And then adding the butter to like the vinegar and salt and pepper that I had in the in the pan, like add some seasoning to your bread. So I'm just going to add a little bit of butter to my pan and then add my bread to it. Getting nice and hot. Now I'm going to add this and let it heat up. It's actually such a large piece of bread that I need another skillet. <laughs> so I'm gonna do a skillet for each piece of bread. And while I'm letting that heat, um, I'm going to demo a quick roasted red pepper pesto that is really good on a sandwich or really good on just toast in the morning. Um, and it has walnuts or you can use cashews. It has garlic cloves, roasted red bell peppers, and um, a half cup of basil or whatever leafy green you have. And then it has, it has olive oil, salt, and pepper. So here I have my half cup of walnuts and I'm just going to add it to a food processor, um, an immersion blender or any sort of blender works as well. And then one clove of garlic. Honestly, it depends on your garlic taste. If you really like garlic, feel free to add two. But uh, for this, I definitely just prefer one. And then I have some bell pepper strips. So. The recipe calls for four roasted bell peppers. I'm just going to add about four here in the pepper rings. So 
So I'm gonna add like four pretty big scoops, which will probably equal out to four roasted peppers. And then I do have basil that I'm going to use, and it calls for about a half cup. Um, when you have basil with the stem, you can definitely use the stem if you're using um, a blender. I prefer to use it. I think it has a lot of flavor. So I'm just going to kind of, since this is a half cup and it's kind of hard to like put your whole basil in a cup, I'm just going to kind of eyeball what a half cup would be. Um, so it's like about a handful. So I'm going to add this and then a fourth cup of olive oil. It's a fourth cup. And it's optional to add some Great Northern beans if you would like to add that to your dip. I actually tried it with that and it is super tasty. Someone sent a chat. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks for joining. Okay, so I have everything in there. I'm going to add a little bit of salt and pepper to taste. So I'm just going to grind some fresh pepper. And um, also add a little bit of salt. And then I'm going to mute myself because it's going to be super loud here. So as Annalise is blending up, can you guys think of what dairy products we've used today in our meals between the soup, the grilled cheese, and the dip? I don't think we have any dairy in the dip, but for the other two, does anyone know or anyone want to chime in and tell us what kind of dairy products we're using? No. So let's see, Josh started and he used butter to saute the onions. We've used cheese, obviously, in our grilled cheese. Have we added some milk into our, into our soup yet? I did. Yep, so we have milk in our soup. And is that everything? Is that all the dairy we've used so far? I have a little uh, grated Parmesan that I was going to put as garnish on top of the soup when it's done also. There we go. There we go. And we started in my um, vegetables. I actually used ghee, which is clarified butter, but still pretty much butter. I have earth balanced butter. Earth balanced butter is a plant-based butter, and they use it with vegetable oils instead of instead of dairy. Um, this is what the red pepper dip turned out like, if anyone wants to get experimental with that. For their grilled cheese, I feel like it would also be really good with um, sun-dried tomatoes or even using spinach or kale instead of the basil. Um, so I think my skillets and my breads are just, en just enough hot for me to add um, my cheeses. So I'm just going to lay my cheese on the skillets and then um, I'll show my pan so then I can start adding the other veggies.
All right, so this is my little, I don't want to tip it because the cheese is going to fall off too much, but this is my little assortment of cheese and my sourdough. And to the other piece of bread, which got hot on the other skillet, I'm going to add um, my sauteed vegetables to. Well, actually, I lied. I'm going to add my sauteed vegetables to that piece and then put the other piece on top of it. Sometimes making grilled cheese is too complicated. All right, so this is what it's looking like. I'm just going to put that other piece of bread on top. And kind of just let that sit. Um, if you want, you can spread your dip over your other piece of bread or you can just dip it after, which I think is what I'm going to do for this episode. Josh, how's your soup going? Uh, no, not really. Nope. Um, I think it's basically ready to serve. So, I mean, I've, I've now just turned it on low. It's bubbling a little bit, but it's, it is ready to go. But first mm. I was going to cut a little bit of basil for my garnish also. So kind of like I did when, uh, well, I'll show you. Like I, I try to find the largest basil leaf and kind of stuff the smaller ones inside that and then roll it up because then it makes it a whole lot easier to get a nice small even ribbon out of it when you're, you're done. You kind of see it's pretty small cut and that should be plenty for two bowls of soup. Yeah. So now I'm just going to go ahead and plate it up. All right, I will in just a moment. I can get that one. All right. Also, as your um, grilled cheese is going, make sure you pay attention to the bottom piece of the bread as it's on the skillet. Um, and make sure to flip it once you kind of see it browning so you don't burn the bottom. I'm actually going to check mine now, even though it hasn't been on for that long, just to make sure it's not burning. And it was just a little bit. So that's really good. I flipped it. <laughs> All right. So now with my soup, just to finish that off, I, if I'm going to put cheese and other things on it, I will put the cheese on first just so the heat of the soup lets it melt just a little bit. Boom, boom, boom. I have a squeeze bottle of olive oil because I have fancy things like squeeze bottles and just <laughs> makes putting a little drizzle on top easier. And then finish that off with the little, a little bit of basil there. And that looks like lunch to me. Yum, that looks so good. Does anyone have theirs finished that wants to show what it ended up looking like? I'll show mine. Okay. We got a, a big, nice pot of soup. I don't know if you can see. But. Yeah, it looks good. And yeah, I, I actually, so mine's plant-based, but I added, so instead of doing the bean dip, I actually put Great Northern Beans inside of my soup mm. to add some flavor and add some protein into it, and it tastes really good. Yum! That sounds really good. Um, yeah, adding Great Northern White Beans actually gives, like, a lot of creamy consistency to recipes, so it's a really good thing to add to, like, dips or 
soups and whatnot. I really like Great Northern White Beans. I think they're super delicious. Um, so while I am waiting for my grilled cheese to finish up, um, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and cooking with us today. And I'm also going to post in the chat box um, this short survey I made on SurveyMonkey. And it just asks like, what would you like to learn about? What things do you wanna cook with that you have in your cupboard? So I'm going to add that and hopefully I hear back from everyone. It is totally anonymous too. So <laughs> just letting you all know, okay. Okay, so that's in there. Um, I'm gonna check on my grilled cheese real quick, see how it's doing. Oh yeah, I think it's just about ready. Almost ready. It helps to slice the cheese as thin as you can. Um, it definitely helps it cook faster. And if you're hungry like me all the time, you definitely want your food to cook fast. <laughs> And Annalise, did you end up putting the dip onto your, your sandwich? Yeah, I did. So I let that piece of bread heat up just a little bit. Um, and then I put the dip on one side of the bread. Whoa, that looks so good. <laughs> oh, <good>. see. <Ooh>. Yay. <laughs> yeah, so I put the dip on one side of the bread and then I had the cheese and the mushrooms. Um, and spinach on the other side, so. So good. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see if it's ready yet. Go to get plate. I also just wanted to quickly show you guys, Annalise was talking about um, ways to buy dairy that's more sustainable. And she had mentioned purchasing from local farms, which is really great. And she also, I wanted to show you guys, so there's a label that we can look out for that kind of is, is a pretty good guideline. And when we see this label, um, it's a really good indication that this um, that the dairy is sustainable and ethical and the, the cows and the animals are treated nicely. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and show you guys this label. Oh yeah, would you mind pulling up that last slide? Um, yeah. I think some of my thoughts will come back to me once I see it with the... All right. Yeah. So let's see. Let's get out of this. All right, so yeah, this certified grass-fed organic dairy is something that um, you can look out for. And sometimes you might not see this in the grocery stores because the grocery stores, especially like the big box grocery stores such as Smith's, um, they, they don't necessarily carry the most sustainable foods. But if you're shopping at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or Sprouts, something that's a little more eco-friendly, it, you might find more of these. Yeah, a lot of grocery stores off of that, Myra, um, a lot of big, big brand stores are catching on to people um, interested in buying grass-fed, cage-free, range-free, uh, or free-range eggs and um, animal products. Um, but there isn't, if there isn't really a label on it, it's most likely not actually what it says to be. Um, there aren't any rules or regulations around adding that to your marketing materials. So a lot of times um, big brands use that kind of labeling as like a natural grass fed organic um, to draw in customers into thinking that it's okay and charging a higher price for it. But when you look out for this certified label, certified grass fed organic dairy, um, that is actually one of the legitimate labels that you can look out for besides USDA also. 
Um, but that just certifies that the animals are being treated fairly um, and that they have the freedom to roam as animals should. So that's just something to look out for. Um, a brand that developed that is um, called Organic Valley. And Organic Valley is a co-op, um, meaning it's owned by a lot of other farmers across the US, to not just a corporation. It's a um, cooperative instead of a corporation. So it's owned by multiple farmers and they get audited every year to ensure that they're meeting this label. Um, so that's a brand that I personally trust and um, recommend for people that are looking to make different choices in buying dairy. Yeah, so some of these I mentioned earlier, um, Heber Valley Cheese, Jenny's Ice Cream, Beehive, Drake Valley Farms, and Wasatch Creameries. Um, they're very transparent about how they treat their animals, what their facilities are, and some of them will even let you come see it for yourself. So yeah, my grilled cheese is done though, and it looks pretty awesome. So this is mine. I am so excited to eat it. Oops, I didn't realize. Sorry, <laughs> it won't let me unmute people. <laughs> Um, does anyone have anything else to add before we go today? Thank you so much, Annalise, for putting this on. I hope everyone enjoys their lunch today. Yeah, I can't thank you enough for helping and um, getting everyone to attend, too. It's so nice to do this every week, and it's really fun to engage with people and connect to them cooking food. So yeah, everyone enjoy your lunch and um, fill out this survey if you can. And we will talk to you all next week. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 See you next week. See ya.